Hi! Welcome to Coffee and Real Talk for Writers, where we get real about the writing life. Writing might be a solitary activity, but becoming a successful author is anything but. So grab a cuppa, pull up a chair, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to my first official episode of the Coffee and Real Talk for Writers podcast. I'm Talina Winters, your host, and it is Thursday, the 6th of January, as I'm recording this. So I hope you had a wonderful holiday season. For me, it was busy but relaxed, so it was a nice, perfect combination of the two. Mostly stayed home. We're in a bit of a deep freeze the last several weeks in northern Alberta. It's been most days in the minus 30s as a high, and that's in Celsius for you Americans. Uh, So it hasn't been too hard to convince me to just hunker in and stay home. Not to mention the fact that the government has not really got us on lockdown right now because of Omicron, but they were strongly encouraging people to not visit too much during the holiday season, which makes sense. So this is my first official episode. It's going to be episode two because I discovered as I uploaded the last one, I couldn't just mark it as episode zero in my website, so we're going to call this episode two. And I'm kind of going to be testing some things out as we go through the first few episodes here, finding my groove, figuring out what I like, uh, figuring out what you like. So please do let me know if there's something that you really appreciated me sharing or if there's something that maybe doesn't interest you as much kindly, of course. (laughs) Um, So I'd like to start off with uh, my highs and my lows. And because I basically just started this and I gave you kind of the big rundown of my last year in my introductory episode, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what happened during my holidays. Um, There were lots of highs during my holidays, which is great. I got to, um, I'd I'd intended to uh, read. I still have the final book of the Wheel of Time series to read, um, which has been a reward read that I've been putting off for several years now, actually, (laughs) because the thing is honking huge and it will require quite a time commitment. I thought, well, great, I've got two weeks of holidays. I will read it during that time. But I actually was really struggling with reading anything. And I, other than listening to about a chapter and a half of an audio book, I didn't really read during the holidays, which is fine. My, I must be at a point where I just need to not do that. I needed to do some other things and I'm fine with that. Uh, so, but I did watch a lot of movies, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. And then I also knocked some other niggling things off of my to-do list that mostly had to do with my knitting business, which is something I've basically had to approach as that's my hobby. Um, even though I, it is a business for me, um, for my mental health and the fact that I can't do everything equally, um, for the last several years, I've just had to allow that part of my business to basically be do something I do for fun. And so, I mean, it does require maintenance. So I did do some things to do with that, which I'll be talking about in a minute. And then, um, our family, actually, this was the first actual Christmas we've celebrated in 18 years. So that was interesting. And I did write a whole blog post about it. If you want to check it out on my blog at www.talinawinters.com slash winters day in, uh, the blog is called God rest ye Mary. Um, so yeah, we had a Christmas tree, the whole shebang. My husband and I surprised the kids with the tree and the decorations at the end of November. Um, we went through the, the lineup at Walmart with all of our decorations and the lady was like giving us funny looks, but, uh, we're like, yeah, we're starting from scratch. So we got to choose it all. It's like, we have this really super pretty coordinated tree, which is the stuff I had only dreamed of as a child. Um, but yeah, it was very nice. It's still up. I had meant to put it down or sorry to take it down, but, um, I have to get some, (laughs) I have to now I have to go back to Walmart and get some boxes, some Rubbermaid boxes to put the uh, decorations and things in so we can put them safely into storage because we store everything 
in our shipping container outside. The other big high for the last several weeks was that uh, a really dear family friend of ours got married yesterday. Um, and so we got to attend that wedding, which was really lovely. My husband was uh, one of the groomsmen and I got to accompany the bride's daughter um, as she sang a song. And that was very fun. But um, it was also the first time, well, it wasn't the first time I've been in public since the beginning of the pandemic, because I definitely have been out in public. It was quite draining socially for me, actually. I was surprised. And I came away from that realizing that after two years, I have definitely, um, my, my social skills have shrunk. Not my social skills. I would say my social stamina has shrunk. And it's not like to a point where I'm not comfortable with it. So it's now got me thinking about how I can change that in this upcoming year. I need to gently kind of expand that muscle again, because really socializing with a group of less than 20 people and being at a wedding and, you know, being in this very safe environment, really, um, for less than three hours shouldn't have been as exhausting as it was. So that's something I'm kind of noodling on now. Anyways, uh, as far as lows, um, because of some of those things I was knocking off my to-do list, uh, a lot of them are things that require me to actually be at my desk and on the screen. And the reason that I don't normally do them is because I'd have to then do those things on a weekend, which is my time away from my desk and my screen. But I have sen essentially have spent so much time at my desk the last week um, that it was just like a regular work week for me. And my back is actually really messed up. I, I constantly struggle with back issues. I do have a monthly massage, which really helps with this. I don't have as much physical activity in my life as I should, which doesn't help. But um, yeah, I am actually a little bit more sore now than before the holidays began. And, you know, all that time watching movies in chairs that are probably not the best for my back did not help. So I'm going to be thinking and looking for ways to address my back issues, um, whether it be particular exercises or whatever, to do more maintenance on it on a regular basis. As far as another low, um, my kids are still home from the Christmas break because the province decided uh, last week sometime that they would extend the Christmas break for a week while schools decided what they were going to do to plan and prepare for the um, challenges presented by the Omicron variant as far as staffing, etc. So uh, it's not really a low in the sense that I love having my kids home and they're great kids and they're pretty quiet. In fact, one of them sitting behind me right now playing video games, you wouldn't even know because he's that awesome. Um, but um, it's also, you know, a little bit of a downer in that they weren't able to go back as soon as they could and, or as soon as they normally would, I guess, for the second year in a row. Um, and also because my old, my second son is in grade 12 this year, they have canceled the diplomas for the end of this month because of this. And I'm not quite sure if that's a good thing in his situation. I mean, it kind of is, but yeah, that's all I'll say about that. All right, so as I mentioned before, um, I did spend the last week of my holiday updating some things, uh, one of which was my website. I was trying, I've had a goal for at least a year, year and a half to make my website more accessible for the visually impaired, especially visually impaired knitters, because um, I read an article in Vogue Knitting about a year and a half ago about uh, the challenges presented to visually impaired knitters. And I was just kind of shocked that there were so many, that uh, there were so many people who are visually impaired, but still knit and that there's, it's such a hungry market because there's so few patterns that they can actually use. And I happen to have my website built on uh, Squarespace, which is already a very accessible platform. I already use a lot of the um, accessibility features uh, just as a habit after long years of working on the internet but there were some things that I needed to address and so I I did that I updated all my tutorials to hopefully make those more easily accessible to 
visually impaired knitters. And also then I wanted to start uh, reworking some of my patterns, starting with my most popular one. And so I did that and republished two of my patterns over the last couple of days. Uh, they're now screen reader accessible. I don't quite have them yet to the point where they can be accessible to print challenge readers, but, um, or knitters, I should say, but I'm getting there and I learned a lot. And it was also a fun project for me because I really love graphic design and I love making beautiful documents, which is probably the nerdiest thing you've heard today. But, uh, yeah, so the process of choosing fonts. And even when I was re redesigning my website a little bit, just going through and choosing fonts and finding things that really work well together and, and creating a good balance. And then when I was re redesigning my one pattern, one of the things I was addressing is, uh, that, uh, it, it was quite crowded and it's a very complicated pattern because it's actually a pattern, three patterns in one. And, um, you know, and, and, not everybody's brain works like mine, I have discovered over the years. So even though most people had no problems with the way I'd written the pattern, I have received multiple comments about how confusing and hard to follow it is. And I'm always looking for ways to make things more accessible and clearer and improve flow and clarity, etc. And so, yeah, even just the, even just taking the time to reformat it and give it some more white space, I think has helped. I did more than just that to improve the clarity, but yeah, so I'll stop nerding out about graphic design now, but that was fun for me. Oh, the other thing that I did to do this is I actually finally learned how to make accessible PDFs, meaning that you can create headings, use the headings and, and other things in a document and people can actually use those to navigate around the document. And I've been wanting to learn how to do this for a while and I don't know why I just didn't Google it sooner because honestly learning how to do that from a document I'd created in Word took about 10 minutes. So I, I felt a little sheepish about that. Um, and I'd already, for my editing clients, I'd already been doing all the work for myself when I create their reports of, of creating the headers and using styles so that I could easily navigate around a Word document because my reports tend to be fairly detailed and long. It can be a little hard to find what you want later. And so I'm always trying to make it easier for my clients, but then I couldn't figure out how to make that document accessible as a PDF, like how to navigate those once I had saved it as PDF. Again, took about 10 minutes. It was just a few clicks of a button while I'm saving. I'm like, oh gosh, Talina, why didn't you just do that earlier? So anyways, I, I know it now. And so that'll be helpful for people going forward, including me. And then the other thing that I've come to realize as I was working on this in the last week is that I really need to a lot more time during my regular business hours, I guess, like not during my holiday time, considering how much work this ended up being. I need to plan to do more work on the knitting aspects of my business during my regular business hours. But because I've been thinking of it as a hobby for the last several years for my mental health, um, it's, it was hard to justify that. However, it is actually bringing in right now that IP is bringing in about 50% of the income I get from IP and I do almost no marketing of my knitting business. So, uh, and that's gross income. So I do do quite a bit of marketing of my books. So I'm making a significantly higher profit on my knitting patterns than I am on my books at the moment. And, uh, so I think that probably justifies some time in my regular business hours dedicated to this kind of maintenance. And then I would be able to actually spend my allotted holiday time in ways that are probably more relaxing and less hard on my back. So <laughs> food for thought I'll be working on going forward. Um, the other thing is though, like this is how I am. I really like to focus on a single thing and then like just burn on it and get it done and knocked off my list. And I know it's like, just, just knowing that I've gotten these several things done in the last week and then, I, and I don't have to worry about them anymore is like this huge, like dopamine rush for me. Um, and during normal business hours or whatever, like when it's not my holiday time, I really can't do that. I have to really make sure that I'm staying on top of my email and my ads and all the things that you normally do in a day. And, um, so it, it, it was, yeah, 
I'm just say I'm just leave it at that. Um, I think that's why I was pushing on the project so hard during the holidays because I knew that as of today I was going to have to get back to my real job kind of thing, and I think I need to maybe work on my mindset about that and rejig it so that I can have a little bit more balance there. All right, moving on. Um, so as I mentioned in my last episode, last year I published the second book of my epic fantasy trilogy in November. And after that, I knew I just needed a break after everything that I've gone through in the last couple of years, I needed to shift genres and I'm already a multi-genre author. So this isn't terrible. I had definitely wanted to get several books out in the epic fantasy series so I could start to gain some traction. And had I had the mental bandwidth to continue, I actually would have gone on and done the third. But really that second book was so long, it it was the equivalent of two books. Like it's 305,000 words. So, you know, it's it's not small. <laughs> I have it sitting on my on my brag shelf, which I finally put together for the first time ever um, near my desk. And, and the spine is two inches thick. It is, it is six by nine inches. And you know, it's, it's a book. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I really feel like I earned the right to take a little break and really for my mental health, it has been one of the best things I've done. Um, so what I'm writing, what I started on, it is a, uh, project I'm really excited about. I'm writing a sweet romance series that's set in an analog of my hometown, uh, my current hometown of Peace River, Alberta. And uh, it's been so much fun because I haven't, I haven't done straight sweet romance before. I've had a sweeter romance in the Friday Night Date Dress, which was my first published book. And it's more of an inspirational romance, but it's not sweet. It's more like romantic women's fiction, to be honest, um, even though that's not how I market it. Um, but that's basically what it is. So I've learned so much about writing and structure and genres and all that, um, in the several years since I began writing. And of course my epic fantasy was the reason I started writing fiction in the first place. So for the first time I've come to a project really looking at it first of all, for what, what do I actually want to do? What genre do I actually want to go in? I've never had a a book idea before where I was like, okay, I want to write this kind of book and then come up with the ideas that went into that genre. Um, before I've always just written basically whatever ideas came to me and which is why I end up with a lot of cross genre stuff and why I've gone into several different genres already. Yeah, so I'm writing this sweet romance. I'm I'm 25% of the way through the first draft of the first book, which is called Every Star That Shines. And I'm very excited about this story because um, as always, I'm always bringing in the things that are interesting to me right now. So the story is about a, uh, an aspiring actress who has a YouTube channel and she gets canceled for a stupid mistake, like just like an innocent mistake. Um... And I've just been so interested in the last several years about cancel culture and kind of the things that go into it and seeing people who have recovered from it well and people who haven't and how it's affected people. And I just, it's an interesting topic to me. I'm, I'm a little bit analytical when it comes to how people work, I guess. And unfortunately, one of the YouTubers who I've been following because she did experience something like this earlier in 2021, just recently announced that she's leaving YouTube. Her name's Lindsay Ellis. And I think that's really unfortunate. Um, so yeah, even though it's sweet romance, I'm definitely going to have a statement in there, but it'll be subtle. It'll mostly be about be about the romance. And because I'm a slow writer and it's hard for me to sometimes create all the promotional things like like the lead magnet magnet that goes into every series or whatever like just take so much time for me to write these things that I'm always trying to find out ways to kind of use what I've already got as a marketing tool so a couple years ago I had written a short story it's about mm, 11,000 words called all I want for Christmas and it was also set in 
and in my hometown, although I never mention the name of the town in the story. And it's not a romance, but it is a very sweet, feel-good, heartwarming family fiction story about a foster kid who wants a set of parents and writes to Santa Claus and then the man across the street who um, kind of softens towards the rowdy kids at the group home next door. And um, I love it. It was written very quickly as an experiment. I was um, using it as a way to figure out whether I could dictate a story. So the first half of it probably was dictated just into a document on my phone, not even using anything fancy for software. And I ended up writing that, um, the last bit of that, over a holiday break as well in December of 2019. And at the time it was for my patrons when I was experimenting with Patreon. Um, and I no longer have a Patreon right now. Um, we'll see if that changes. I've noodled with the idea. If this podcast takes off, I might start one up again. But um, for now, it was it was too much. I just couldn't keep up with it, especially as my mental health went down in 2020. I ended up closing it down. Anyway, I digress. The point is, I had this story. I'd been meaning to re-edit it. Um, well, to actually edit it. I never edited it when I published it to Patreon. And um, to put it out as a gift for my readers and also just to see what the response was. And so I did that. Um, after I published The Sphinx's Heart in November, I went ahead and I re-edited it, did the covers, and then also knowing that I was going to be publishing the Sweet Romance series next year, starting, um, the, the first one's going to be coming out in August, I hope, um, you know, that maybe it, it, it would probably have some audience crossover between the kinds of people who enjoyed this sweet family fiction and the sweet romance. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll put it out there as a free story over the holidays, and then I'll have, in the back, I'll have a pre-order link for my first book, Every Star That Shines. So that made it an interesting challenge for me because um, part of the stress that I had with The Sphinx's Heart was that I had this pre-order date that always, like everything for that book just took so much longer than I anticipated. And I had a pre-order date set up for last, I think it was like last March, um, that I ended up having to cancel when I got close enough I'm like there is no way I'm going to be done that in that amount of time but at the time I'd set it up I thought oh yeah that's plenty of time I'll be able to do that no problem and so then I got to that and fortunately Amazon uh, had a policy during the pandemic where they were waiving the now let me back up in case you don't know what this is um, for for most of the platforms, and I'm a wide author, so, you know, I, don't, I had it up on several platforms. Most platforms, it's no problem to move the date on a pre-order. Um, they don't have any real repercussions for you other than the fact that your readers who have pre-ordered it may not like that and they may cancel their pre-order, which did happen. I'll get to that. Um, but for Amazon or KDP, uh, which is Kindle Direct Publishing, their typical policy is you can move it out for a month, but if you have to move it further than that, you basically, you have to cancel it and you lose your rights to create a pre-order on KDP for a year. And The Sphinx's Heart, honestly, was the first book I'd ever even put a pre-order up for. I've never had a, been in a situation where that would have been beneficial for me before that. And I just wanted to experiment with it. And so I, I created it for March and then knew that there was no way I would make that. So I think I did originally bump it. I don't even know if I bumped it the month. I think I canceled it knowing it wouldn't happen. And like within a day, I don't, I didn't even ask for it, but I got the email from Amazon that they were waiving my penalty of not being able to create another pre-order for a year. And so unfortunately I wasn't able to just like reuse the same listing. I had to create a new one. So I did lose the, a bunch of the pre-orders that I had, which wasn't a ton, but I did have some. So that was a little bit painful. But then I set it up for October of 2021. Thinking, oh, lots of time because I was almost finished the first draft. And normally editing a book doesn't take me that long. But normally my books aren't 300,000 words and super, super complicated either. So 
um, again, <laughs> it, it turned into a big thing. So I, I ended up having to push it. I pushed it as far as I could so that the release date ended up being November 11 of 2021. And it was so stressful all the way along. I ended up skipping some of the steps that I would have normally done. The only reason I was even able to do that is because my editor, whom I've worked with for several projects now, uh, she was willing to take the book in chunks. So I was very organized in my revision, but I didn't finish the, finish the first draft till the beginning of June, I think like three or four days before my, I'd scheduled my editor to start on the project. And so, um, I made a plan, like I went through and I made a plan of all the things I knew I needed to change. I'd already had a developmental edit on the first three quarters of the book, because again, I'd had this developmental editor scheduled, but the book wasn't done by the time I got to that date. So I sent her the first three quarters of the book and she gave me some great feedback on that. Um, and then, so I was able to use that feedback. Plus, you know, I'm also a developmental editor and I'm pretty, I'm able to detach myself from my work to the point of being able to look at it and figure out what needs to be fixed. So, um, I was able to make a really good plan. And then I was able to, to, to start that revision sequentially and send my editor, the book in pieces. If it weren't for that, there's no way I would have even been able to publish the book last year. Um, so all that to say the pre-order was stressful. I think we finished, I got the final bit of the book back from my editor only like a t couple weeks before the pre-order date. So <laughs> did not get to send it out to ARC readers in advance. Um, I had had like, other than those two editors, I don't think I'd had anybody else look at the book. And that is the first time I've ever done that considering the, uh, contents of the story that felt very risky to me. Um, I didn't really like that feeling. So I was like, I'm never doing a pre-order again until I finish the first draft of a book. Well, then I had this idea <laughs> and marketing wise, it seemed to make sense. And I knew that this book would be way shorter and that I would be able to do it. And even the pre-order date I've set is still two months beyond the date that I expect to actually be finished with the book. And I really hope I'm right, but I guess we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> anyway, one thing I did learn, uh, putting that little story up for free, even though, uh, it hasn't, I mean, the pre-order date is set for the end of September. So, you know, it's not like I expected to get a ton of pre-orders. What I did, and, and I haven't, I've gotten like one, but what I did see was a huge spike in the sales of my romantic women's fiction book, Finding Heaven, which is not sweet at all. Um, it is inspirational, but it's not clean. And I, I, I have been advertising this. Like one of my goals, my business goals for last year was to become better at advertising my books. And I did try both an Amazon well, I think I'd done Amazon ad challenge with Brian Cohen the year before and discovered that it was really hard to advertise this particular book with that. Actually, I wasn't able to make it work for any books, to be honest. I still suck at Amazon ads. I'm not going to lie, but I took a Facebook ad webinar with Alana Terry last spring and I thought, okay, well, this was pretty basic. I'm going to start experimenting with Facebook ads a little bit more. I had tried it out a bit before without a lot of success. But in 2019, I had recovered Finding Heaven. Actually, between 2019 and 2020, I had actually made new covers for all of my books. I'd also updated the blurb or the, sorry, the book description for most of them. And I felt like they were a much more packageable product. Um, I'd actually even revised and published revised versions of two of them. So yeah, I was, I had done a lot to make sure that the product itself was, uh, top notch. And I knew I had a very solid product. Um, so then what I wanted to do was learn how to advertise it better. So I took this Facebook ads webinar with Lana Terry. Um, and I recommend checking out her stuff. She has a podcast by the way, as well. I don't remember what it's called right now, but if you just search her, it's Alana, A L A N A Terry T E R R Y. Um, you'll find her platform. She also has a very fun, uh, newsletter, for authors that I got for a while after taking the webinar. 
I did eventually unsubscribe just because I get too much email and I don't like to let my inbox fill up with clutter. If I'm not reading it regularly, I'll just unsubscribe because I know that it costs the author money to send that to me. And I'm the kind of person that when I'm ready to learn that thing again, I'll just go find it. Um, I don't necessarily need that reminder per se. Anyway, yeah, I, I had been advertising and I'd actually had a fairly successful ad running on Finding Heaven in the last several months of, like I started advertising it in July of 2021. And by, I think by September, it was regularly profitable, not super profitable, but I was making, like I'm still just running at the minimum amount per day, but I was making a couple of bucks a day, which isn't terrible. I was usually selling one to two copies a day on average. And I had tried to put it up and I had uh, gotten a little bit of traction, but then um, Facebook had a big snafu at the beginning of October that totally screwed up that ad. And so I turned it off for a couple of weeks, but then um, I tweaked it a bit and then started it up a new version and that one was doing really really well um but after I published all I want for Christmas for free I have had just like huge spike over the holidays and I don't know if that's just typical for the holidays um because I've never been advertising like this before or if um or if it's because I published all I want for Christmas and I think it might be a bit of both I'm not really sure yet so Next year, looking back, maybe I'll have a little bit more data, but um, at least for the last several weeks, uh, that ad has been very profitable. And honestly, I have made in profit almost as much in the first week of January. I've made almost 50% of the amount that I profited from my advertising in all of 2021, if that tells you how very little I made from that book last year. Um, because when you're learning ads, it costs a lot of money. And so I was constantly reinvesting that. Now this money may get reinvested too. So probably will, let's be honest. Anyway, moving on. Oh, the other thing I want to mention about that before I move on though, is that honestly, that particular story is short and it's sweet and it's not quite as in depth as I would normally write. I, I like it. And, uh, but there were a few things that I realized after I'd published it that I, wish I would have just tweaked a little bit more. And so for me personally, I would probably rate that story about like three and a half stars. Okay. <laughs> Which is not something I don't normally like to put out work that I wouldn't call a five star piece of work. Even if other people don't like it, I want to be really proud of it. And then I won't really care what other people say about it. So, and it's interesting. I have gotten, you know, some ratings that were around three stars on this book. Um, but lots of people are giving it five stars and telling and leaving reviews like it was exactly what they wanted. It was a lovely, sweet little story that was just perfect. And so that was just a reminder to me that uh, I am not my reader. We tend to forget that as writers, that we're not our readers. And um, I, I, I'm kind of like bracing against the inevitable person that brings up the thing that I wish I would have changed. Nobody has yet. So, you know, it's probably just me. I'm way harder on myself than any of my readers will be. But then, you know, like this is a 300,000 word story that I poured blood, sweat and tears into for two years. And, and when that gets a negative review, boy, that does that one hurt, but I'm really, really proud of that story. So it doesn't hurt as much as it could. All right. So other stuff that I tried with this book, what, well, book, this short story, all I want for Christmas, um, early in December, I think it was, I heard an interview on the creative pen podcast with, uh, Oh, what's his name? The guy who started up deep Zen, which is an AI narration company. And she shared, Joanna Penn shared a clip of a book that she'd had done using the AI narrated voices of deep Zen. And I was floored at how good it was. Like if I hadn't been told that that was an AI narrated piece of work, I probably wouldn't have known because I have heard, honestly, I've heard actual narrators that sounded less enthusiastic than that or less nuanced than that. Let's say that because enthusiastic isn't the right word. And so I was like, well, let's check it out. 
Um, when you write really long books like I do, boy, you need to have some pretty deep pockets in order to get them narrated. So I was like, well, let's try see if this is a way that I could maybe make this a little more affordable in the short term so I can actually get my books into um, audio uh, until I can afford and justify uh, investing in human narration for these books. So I, because I had all I want for Christmas and I, what I thought is that, well, what I'll do is I'll get them to do this. It, it will be less than an hour of narration. It won't take very long to put together. And um, then I can maybe offer that as a, to my readers as a way of getting them used to the idea of AI narrated books for one thing, if I decide to pursue this for say the rest of the series. And also just to try it, to see what the process is like, to see what the product turns out like. Unfortunately, it was a little too late in the month, I think, when I started that because... And then I was also a little too busy with trying to get my business ready so I could go on holidays. So I actually wasn't able to send back the proofed version of the audio files to them until just before Christmas. And at that point, I, I knew I'm like, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to offer this to my readers in time for Christmas. So I didn't even mention it to them when I told them about the free uh, ebook, which is fine. But now I, I actually just got those files. I noticed I got the email notification that I have those files waiting for me now, the final files. And so now, now I'm like, okay, what am I even going to do with this? Like, should I publish it now? Um, when I published the story originally in 2019, it was already two, uh, two days after Christmas and it was kind of underwhelming. Of course, I didn't have very many patrons, uh, but I didn't really get much of a response about it. So I don't know if I publish it now, I think it's a little bit late. I missed the Christmas boat but I might have a few of my readers who listen to it just out of curiosity because of the AI narrated part of it. But now I'm trying to decide whether I want to do that or just like basically sit on it and publish it probably next fall. In fact, I think that's probably what I'll do. I'll publish it next, like maybe, maybe November just as a way of, again, increasing interest in the rest of the series because I'll already have hopefully published my second book in the series by then. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm always experimenting, but the very coolest part of that is that, uh, Deep Zen has licensed the voice of Edward Herman, who played, uh, Lorelai Gilmore's father on Gilmore Girls, but of course he's done a lot of other work and he was a very beloved audiobook narrator. So he, there was a lot of his voice available to them and they, he, he passed in 2014, unfortunately. The estate did license his voice to Deep Zen for them to use. And of the voices available from them, I thought his voice suited the tone of the story best. So I chose him and it was really, really cool to hear his voice narrating my words, even though it wasn't actually him. There were definitely some... Uh, I would say some shortcomings in the technology. The the one that it seemed like the technology is pretty awesome. Um, but it did seem to have a lot of challenges with getting the tone and emotion right in dialogue. Like the uh the narrative part of the stories were actually really, really good, but it was the conversations that I ended up having to give the most notes back to them about. And so I'm curious when I go to listen to those final files, if they were able to fix those and it's still not something, I don't know if I'd want to personally listen to that for, for five hours or six hours. I don't know. We'll see how much they were able to adjust the things that I asked them to change. And maybe I'll let you know about that next week. Okay. Goodness. I've been talking for a while now. I was going to try and keep these episodes to half an hour or less. Maybe I'm just too much of a talker for that. So be warned going forward. I'm a talker and I'm long-winded. So maybe these will be longer than I thought. So actually, um, I would love to have a segment here where I answer questions from listeners. So if you have any questions about um, writing craft or marketing or business or just things about how I do things or whatever, um, please feel free to send them to me. You can, you can send them through the contact form on my website, which is talenawinters.com, T-A-L-E-N-A-W-I-N-T-E-R-S.com. Um, and there's a contact form up in the top right, or you can email them to me at talena at talenawinters.com. 
That was a lot of at Talinas, but I'm hoping you figured that out. Okay, so um, one of the cool things that I did with this series that I've never done before, um, I used Scrivener to write on. And because I knew, I, uh, like one of, one of the things I have as a freebie on my website for people is uh, downloaded of, a, of the notes on a presentation I, I do at conferences called Five Point Plot Structure. And I have since developed that um, Five Point Plot Structure idea to incorporate beats from multiple genres, um, especially romance. And I read Gwen, Gwen Hayes's book, Romancing the Beat, last fall. And I was like, not really surprised by any of the things in there, but I actually felt like she missed a couple of beats. I think her total story beat structure is about 20. And I think mine's like 25, 26. Like, and I've noticed that like when I've been editing clients books who, who are, that have our romance that sometimes I feel like there's, there's some things missing as far as the development of the story or relationship is concerned. And so I feel like my plot structure, like I, it's not that I didn't learn anything from Gwen Hayes's book. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, Romancing the Beat. Please go look, check it out. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just felt like there's a couple of places in there where it was a little bit loosey goosey. It's like, go do that. Like now they do this. It's like, well, but how, how, what does that actually look like? So, um, what I did, and I'm hoping to eventually get to this to the point where I can write my own book about it or, um, share this template somehow, but I created a template in Scrivener with all the, with the five point plot structure beats. And then I used that to plot out my, uh, my book, my every star that shines book. And actually this is something I've also never done before. Um, because I'm, I'm not normally this much of a plotter, to be honest, I'm kind of like halfway along the scale between discovery writer and plotter. And, uh, oftentimes if I don't leave enough mystery in there, then my brain rebels. And then I have to, I change the whole thing somewhere. And then I'm like, okay, fine we'll just go with this now. And then my plot is out the window. Um, so what that means is that oftentimes it's, it's difficult to remember what actually ended up in the book, etc. So what I did is I created this Scrivener file. that's actually going to be my entire series within this one Scrivener file. And then within that file, I have one folder for each book of the series. And then within that folder, I have like the, the folders of the five points of the plot. And then within that I had, I created just pages, which I'll convert into chapters, um, of each of the, the beats as I plan them. And so what that's going to allow me to do, I'm really excited about this is, uh, it'll make it really easy to search for one thing. Um, if I'm looking for something as I get further into the series, if I'm looking for for a name or a person or figuring out if they did this or a description, I can easily search. It's already in the one folder. And I do have a separate story Bible that I keep in one note, which is where I find it easier to just keep track of characters, etc. I don't know. It's a little messy right now. I'm that's where I did my epic fantasy and it worked just fine, but um, I'm, I'm not really loving how it's working for this particular series just yet. So I'm still figuring that out. But, um, so the other thing that I think it will cut down on the work is that, um, I just upgraded to Scrivener 3.0 for windows last fall, and there was a way steeper learning curve than I anticipated on that. However, one of the vast improvements over the previous version is that with a few clicks, you can switch out front and back matter for a book, which is really, really nice because you can, um, have different front and back matter than for uh, ebooks or different platforms. If you wanted to include specific links to a store in a different, for a different platform, etc. And so I thought, well, that might also be helpful for creating front and back matter for these books in a series. I'm not really sure how that's going to play out yet, but I just anticipate that it'll be less require me to open up extra files a lot less. I can just quickly go through there and just do some copying and pasting and then change things around a little bit and it'll be easier and it'll be ready to go for the next time. So, um, especially when it comes to the other books by page, you know, like 
man, that's one of the biggest pains in the butt to keep updated. So if I just have to do one page in the whole series that I can just keep updated and then reuse for every book, that'll be really helpful. Okay, so just a few other things that I were awesome this week. Oh, by the way, if you have not tried out Scrivener and you would like to, I do have an affiliate link for them. So if you would check it out through my affiliate link, that would be nice. It would just send a few bucks my way. I don't even know. I actually have never had anyone use it yet, but um, it's at talinawinters.com slash Scrivener, and that will take you right to the, their site, but through my affiliate link. Thanks. Okay, so a couple of resources I thought were really helpful. I listened to these podcasts over the holidays and they were great. One was on Six Figure Authors, uh, episode 112, How to Smartly Invest Back into Your Book Business. I recommend that. I will put these links in the show notes to these episodes. I learned stuff even though I've been doing this for years, but I think that it'll be especially helpful for people who are more starting out. Uh, On the Life Lessons with Gin and Sherry podcast, episode 57, they talked about intermittent fasting for life is the name of the episode. And I've been intermittent fasting for some time, but it wasn't until I, I found Jen Stevens' work in September that um, I really started to see s- some progress as far as weight loss is concerned. I've been doing it for other reasons as well, but it's been nice to finally start to see that scale number go down because since the beginning of the pandemic, it has just gone up and up. So um, yeah, I recommend checking that out because she... Jen has a new book that just came out called Cleanish. I haven't read it yet. I did read her first book, Delay, Don't Deny, and it was super helpful in my journey. But um, that particular episode will kind of give you the overview of her approach to intermittent fasting um, in that one episode. So then you can decide if you want to check it out more. Also, The Creative Pen, episode number 596, Improve Your Sleep and Creativity with Dr. Anne D. Bartolucci. As someone who is typically a night owl, Um, and then wasn't for the first time in my life after burnout. And I'm now kind of sneaking back into that zone. I found it really helpful to listen to this because I feel like there's a lot of myths about sleep and biorhythms that circulate around. And it was kind of validating actually to hear some of the things in that episode about, um, how our bodies work and how sleep works and how, you know, like even the myth that you need eight hours a night, every night. And yes, according to Dr. Ann, it, it is a myth. And I was just like, oh, lovely. So yeah, I recommend going to check that one out. And I intend to re-listen to that one actually, because it was quite helpful. All right. So I told you that I watched all these movies with my family over the holidays. And what's fun is, um, there was four days of the holiday that it was just me and my third son, home and he's been wanting me to watch spider-man all the spider-mans for some time of course i've watched the toby Maguire ones way back in the day when they first came out but i have um three sons and they are all superhero nuts and probably about six years ago or so i just said i'm done with superhero movies i'm so done there was just like i'd been all marveled out and dc universe out and i said you guys just watch them without me. I don't have time and I don't even care. Um, and so there were quite a few movies that I missed because I, I just didn't want my family to have to wait for me to watch them for one thing. It was part of it, but also I was just really tired of it. I wanted to watch some movies that were in other genres and I had limited time to do that. And so I would like, they would go to the theater by themselves, etc. So I hadn't seen any of the amazing Spider-Man movies. I hadn't seen any of the new Tom Holland ones. I have actually watched a few of the superhero movies over the years. It's not like I missed out on them completely. And this past year, especially, I've been kind of catching up on some of those big ones I missed, even though I knew that, you know, like Thanos clicked half the universe away (laughs) already. You know, I still watched, still watched it, still enjoyed it. Um, But anyway, so my son and I, we were like, okay, what we'll do is we'll do a movie marathon and like you choose half the movies and I'll choose half the movies. So he chose all these super uh, Spider-Man movies and we watched through them all. And I have to say, I really enjoyed them. I watched the amazing Spider-Man one and two with Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. And then we watched the first two uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. Again, I really enjoyed them, but I particularly, particularly enjoyed um, 
the Andrew Garfield ones, and I do recommend them. I thought they did some really neat things with the tropes there. Um, I particularly liked the uh, version of Spider-Man that Andrew Garfield got to play, and I thought he did it well. Um, Emma Stone, of course, was brilliant as Gwen Stacy. And yeah, it was just, it was a really neat um, way of interpreting the uh, the character and the universe and the mythology that goes along with it. So that was a new to me one I enjoyed. I also enjoyed Encanto, um, highly recommended. Of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote the music and it was fantastic. I just love it. And then at the very beginning of the holiday, we watched Tick, Tick, Boom because um, apparently my whole family is Andrew Garfield fans and I have now been converted. But anyway, uh, no, I do recommend that. It's the story of Jonathan Larson who wrote Rent and I'm not going to go into it today, but I kind of tweaked some things in me as far as my dream about being a musical theater writer. And so I'll probably talk about that in a later episode at some point. For my part, I mostly picked movies to rewatch that I enjoyed that I thought my son would enjoy. And some of them held up um, and some of them didn't. And I think all of them were movies that I had originally watched or hadn't watched since I'd become a writer and an editor. So it was interesting to rewatch these and see what they had done with the story and to see whether they held up. So the first one was The Family Man. Oh my gosh, still one of my favorite Christmas movies ever. Love it and definitely held up. Also watched Premonition with Sandra Bullock. And while it was still an entertaining movie and I thought they did some really things really well in it, man, there are a couple of gaping plot holes in there that I just cannot get over now and I don't think I'll ever watch it again. They don't want to ruin it for you. It's definitely worth a watch at least one time because they did some really cool things with how the story played out. But whenever you're messing with time in a story, it's really easy to get bunged up and they did. They, I can't think of a good phrase that I want to actually say, but they really messed it up. If you, you know, are analyzing afterwards, you're like, wait a second, that didn't add up. And yeah, so now I'm like, I'm done. But anyways, we also watched Mr. and Mrs. Smith with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. And that is still a fun ride. Um, I remember watching it back in the day with my husband. And we're like, yep, that was a good popcorn movie. And it absolutely still is, still holds up. I really, um, now being at the age that the characters were in the movie, um, could appreciate it on a different level as well. So that was fun. And then we also, believe it or not, this was not my suggestion. My son suggested this, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. He didn't realize it was so much of a rom as a com, <laughs> but he enjoyed it. And so did I. I mean, I've seen it many times now. Um, still a fantastic comedy in a painfully hilarious kind of way. They do such a great job in that movie. And then being the 20th anniversary of the Lord of the Rings, sorry, the Fellowship of the Ring releasing, we did watch the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy as a family and never have my husband and I mocked it so much because there were definitely some things were like, oh, wow, that was really melodramatic, but we still love it. We do it in complete love. We totally are huge fans of the series, but, um, and the books, <laughs> But it was like, wow, by the time we were done with that, because we have the director's cut version, so they're like 12 hours of movie. We're like, whew, we're done. <laughs> Let's do something else. So I think that's when we watched the How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Okay. Jeez Louise. Let's wrap this thing up. Uh, so for this year, um, I recently heard an interview with Jeff Woods at The One Thing. And I'm just going to put links in the show notes to the interviews I heard with him. But I do recommend his One Thing podcast, especially the most recent episode, 332, um, which is talking about this year's success coming down to one thing. And it really tweaks some things in my brain about how to focus my year when I have such a diverse business and so many different aspects that I need to think about to really understand whether or not, like to, to give myself a metric about whether the activities I'm doing are going to actually help me reach my goal. So a lot of people do a word of the year, phrase of the year. For me, I don't normally do this, but I did have one last year. I called it the year of self-care. And I would say that I was successful in that. This time last year was, in fact, almost to the day, the lowest point I've had in many, many years. And 
today I'm in a way better space than I was last year because I was deliberate in making sure that I was nourishing myself and making sure that I was taking care of me first, which was probably the first time I've ever done that. Um, so this year I thought I'd try it again. Um, and my phrase for the year is find the joy. I want to be able to really find the the joy and the happiness in things that had kind of become drudgery, especially after that very stressful year. And I was, I'm kind of already on this track. So it's more like just, you know, focusing on that as, as kind of the point of whatever I'm going to be doing this year. And just as a daily reminder and a habit to remember, to be grateful and to find the joy in just the little things as well as the big things. As far as my one thing, as for my business, um, my goal for the year is to create a stable, wide income base from my IP, the stuff that I already have, stuff that I'm pr producing, and continuing to create and connect with people who will love my creations in a way that is sustainable for me. And that sustainable is always the balancing act for me because I tend to love to just like dive into things and overdo it. Um, and then try, I want to try the things, but I have tried a lot of things now already and decided things that are not for me. So one of the things I'm going to be doing this year is saying no to social media. And it's not an, a hard no, but honestly, social media has been such a drain for me for the last several years that I am going to be just treating it more as, as a personal use thing, um, which is not something you typically do when you're an author. Um, but I mean, I'll use it for my business, but it's not something I'm going to stress about. I guess it what it comes down to. I'm going to be focusing on my podcast and my blogging and just connecting with my existing clients and, and, and readers and making sure that, you know, my newsletter, that's a big one for me. So yeah, just keeping my energy focused on those things instead of worrying so much about social media, which I find a very draining space right now still. So for next week, I'll be making progress on my manuscript. I haven't, I didn't actually do any writing over the holidays. Um, and I'm excited to dive back into that. Hopefully start starting tomorrow morning. And then I start a new editing project next week, uh, for one of my favorite clients in a fantasy world that I love. So I'm very excited about that and about getting back into my regular routine. So my big thought for the, my one for the road is to begin as you mean to carry on. And that is exactly what I'm intending to do with my business this year. Um, and I hope that you have taken some time to really think about how you want to approach your business this year and your writing and to do the things that you need to do so that by this time next year, you can look back and say, yes, I actually made progress on that. Of course, you know, life happens and things can change on a moment, but you, you got to start with the plan. And I also want to have a little mug quote of the week, either a real one or something. I think we make a good one here at the end. And actually my mug today is a little bit perfect for the weather we've been having lately. It's uh, one I got from chapters and it says, it's only cold if you're standing still. And it was minus 28 as the highest high today. So, um, <laughs> So it's only cold if you're standing still, but I would have to add like, eh, if it's minus 40 outside, it's still cold, even if you're not standing still. But of course, the more you're moving, the more it's not. Anyways, that has been episode two of Coffee and Real Talk for Writers. I am going to generally try to keep it a little shorter than this. I'll, I'll tweak my plan for next week, but thanks for sticking with me if you, if you stayed to the end. Um, please remember to send me a question or any comments. Uh, by email, you can also comment on the, on the episode on my blog, um, on my website, and you can find that at talinawinters.com slash podcast. Also, if you got value from this and you'd like to say thank you, um, you can go to my website, talinawinters.com slash podcast, and you can buy me a coffee. Thank you so much for listening. I hope your 2222 is off to a great start. And I look forward to chatting with you again next week. Have a great week. Coffee and Real Talk for Writers has been produced by Talina Winters. You can find episode show notes, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you're feeling generous, buy me a coffee at talinawinters.com slash podcast. And be sure to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Tell your friends to come by too. The kettle's always on. So until next time, I hope you keep writing 
and keep it real. Thanks for listening. Bye. My Secret Wish Publishing presents All I Want for Christmas, A Peace Country Story by Talina Winters. Digitally narrated using the voice of Edward Herman. To Stephen Curtis Chapman. Thank you for the inspiration. Chapter 1 Dear Santa, I don't mean to complain, but I've asked you for the same thing every year since I was four. And when you bring me anything, it's only chocolates and oranges and cheap toys from China. I don't need another fidget spinner this year, okay? Anyway, I don't know where else to turn. I'm 12 now, and they just moved me to a group home. No one ever gets adopted from a group home. So you're basically my last hope. If I'm really, really good this year, would I finally deserve a new set of parents? Trevor stared at the words. He couldn't think what to write next. Not that it mattered. Maybe Byron was right. He was a bit babyish. A letter to Santa Claus. Really? What was he, six? He needed to grow up and face the realities of the world. The group home was where kids like him went when no one knew what to do with them anymore. When no foster family would take them in, or there were none left to try. He lashes out. Can't make a connection with him. We've tried everything. Don't feel safe. We can't handle him. The overheard excuses in the voices of foster parents past rang in his ears. He folded the paper and stuffed it in his backpack along with his pencil, then grabbed his stuff and went downstairs for breakfast. A dish of eggs and a plate of toast sat on the table with one remaining clean place setting. Mrs. Wood, the day shift house supervisor, had just started unloading the dishwasher. When she saw him, she grabbed some snacks from the counter and stepped toward him. You're late again, Trevor. The bus will be here in a few minutes. Here, take some food. She handed him a granola bar and an orange. He rolled his eyes. More oranges. Thanks, he mumbled and dropped them in his pack. Grabbing a piece of toast, he held it by the corner with his teeth while he tucked his arms through the straps of his backpack, then jammed on sneakers and headed toward the door. Remember, your social worker is coming after school, Mrs. Wood called after him. I'll be here, he said through the toast. He ripped off the bite in his mouth and jerked the door open, slamming it behind him and ignoring the subsequent shout of reprimand from Mrs. Wood. The other kids were at the bus stop already, five other boys in all. They had all been at the home longer than Trevor. Most of them had been in foster care since they were young, too. If Santa Claus was real, Trevor was probably on his naughty list, but he obviously wasn't the only one. He adjusted his oiler's ball cap and shrugged his backpack higher on his shoulder, hoping no one would notice him. That's the only way he ever got through a day, by being invisible. Not an easy feat for a chubby boy like him, who was tall for his age, but he managed okay most of the time. Across the street, Mr. Harris was putting the finishing touches on a near-life-size lawn nativity scene. The tall, angular man's footprints had completely disintegrated the fresh layer of snow that had fallen yesterday. Lionel, a 14-year-old boy with a wide build, clumpy dark blonde hair, and freckled ruddy cheeks, sneered and crossed his arms. Who is he trying to impress? My dad would always decorate our lawn with a life-sized Santa balloon and a sleigh you can really sit in. Plus, all eight reindeer. His voice cracked, and he slammed his mouth shut. Trevor wondered if that were true. Lionel talked about his dad a lot, but even though he'd seen Lionel get picked up for family visits, it hadn't been often, and he was pretty sure Lionel only ever got to see his mom and an older sister. Lionel didn't have any pictures of his dad among the photos on his dresser in the room they shared either. Trevor suspected Lionel's stories about his dad were more wishful thinking than anything. Still, it was fun thinking of that beautiful lawn ornament, so he said nothing. Byron, a 15-year-old kid with shaggy black hair and a lanky frame who'd been in the system since he was two and therefore had the most seniority of all of them, 
put his hands to his mouth to amplify his voice. Mr. Harris, Mary's boobs are showing. Mr. Harris straightened and cast an angry look at the group of waiting teens. He turned back to his project and tucked a blue blanket around the baby Jesus, then walked stiffly up his front steps and into the house. Lionel and Byron laughed so hard they started to cry. Trevor stared at the nativity scene, admiring the small details like the light in the star above the manger and the real baby blanket wrapped around the baby Jesus doll. He thought the scene was nice, but he didn't want to draw the wrath of the other boys by saying so. Besides, he was from the same band as Byron. That made them brothers, and brothers should stick together, shouldn't they? On the other hand, it did seem a little mean to put a happy family scene right across the street from a house for kids, whose prayers didn't usually get answered. Trevor pulled his ball cap down further over his forehead and turned away from the Harris yard to wait for the bus. Gary Harris took off his gloves and hung up his coat in the entrance closet. When he climbed the stairs to the main floor of the split-level home, his wife, Louise, stood at the living room picture window, admiring the nativity scene and holding a mug of steaming coffee. Did you hear what that kid said? Gary put a hand on the small of his wife's back and looked across the street. The school bus had stopped at the curb, obstructing the view of the offending teen. Lou shook her head, her dark brown hair bouncing near her chin as she did. I saw him yelling, but didn't hear what. What was it? Gary thought better of giving a verbatim quote. Let's just say he didn't seem impressed by the nativity this year. Is there more of that coffee left? Um hum. Lou pointed absently at a mug on the kitchen counter, her attention still fixed on the boys across the street. Already doctored how you like it. Gary grinned, his bruised ego mollified by his wife's thoughtfulness. He grabbed the mug and came to stand next to Lou once more. Have I told you today how amazing you are? He kissed her cheek. She smiled back, her dark eyes sparkling. You have now. She glanced out the window. He followed her gaze as the final teen disappeared behind the bus, a chunky brown-skinned boy with uncombed black hair covering his ears that was mostly hidden beneath a blue oiler's ball cap. Lou seemed deep in thought. What are you thinking about, he asked, then took a sip of his coffee. He hoped she wouldn't bring up the idea of fostering again. I was just thinking about how much you love Christmas and sharing the joy of Christmas, she said, putting an arm around him. And, he prompted, dreading the answer. He knew that look in her eye. And, I was thinking that those boys over there probably don't know a lot about the joy of Christmas. Maybe that's why they don't really get the whole nativity thing. Gary stopped cold. There were moments in life when you knew a truth bomb had just landed on your head and changed your world. This was one of those moments. He sat slowly on their overstuffed black leather armchair. I have never thought about it that way before. I'm a complete idiot. Here I was, all upset that a teenage boy didn't like my nativity scene. But why would he? Gary glanced up at Lou, meeting her compassionate brown eyes. What should I do? How should I show them what Christmas is all about? Short of fostering, of course, he added quickly, in case she'd been leading up to that. A look of sadness flashed over her face, then changed to an amused smile. She ran her hand down his arm and took his hand as she sat down on the coffee table beside him. I was thinking that maybe you could try bringing them a little Christmas spirit. And what's the best way to do that? She smiled at him as though she were confident he already knew the answer. He stared at her blankly. Forgive me for being an even bigger idiot. But can you help me out here, Lou? Her smile brightened and she raised her eyebrows to prompt him. Bring them presents. He grinned back. That he could do.